All right. Hi, uh, my name is Jess Stouth. Uh, I work uh, for a company called Quantopian. Um, a little brief background um, disclaimer, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm professing to talk about Python today, but I'm really uh, a user of Python. I don't usually build stuff other than analyses and data analysis. Um, but I'm gonna talk to you about um, what I think is a pretty cool tool that my research team at Quantopian has built um, in the last couple of months um, for the purpose of evaluating investing strategies or automated trading algorithms. Um, and these are tools that are commonly used by a lot of um, professional quants or industry quants and some individual investors and quants who want to try to look at um, a systematic investing strategy and uh, basically take the data that it outputs, such as returns from stocks that are bought and sold, um, risk factors and try to understand uh, from the outside and from the exhaust data whether a trading algorithm is, is making money, has made money in the past, why it made money in the past, and how it's going to make money in the future. Um, so I'm going to assume that uh, this is uh, obviously expert in Python crowd, but maybe not as much background in finance. Um, but if you do have a background in finance or quant finance or algorithmic trading, could you raise your hand? I'll get a sense. Well, all right then, I take that back. So. Moving right ahead. Um, so I don't think I should have to sell this, uh, but uh, in a lot of talks that, that I start, um, start up and say, why use Python for quant finance? I think this is kind of becoming more and more of a foregone conclusion. There's a lot of obvious great things about it. It's general purpose. It lets us avoid stringing together lots of sort of use case specific languages that might have great features, um, but are, are frustrating to have to sort of daisy chain together um, or code analyses and recode them in other languages that are better, depending on whether you have a research or production use case. Um, it's very easy to learn. Even I can learn it. Uh, and I come from a, from a research background, not computer science. Um, and also there's this you know, incredibly vibrant and rapidly expanding ecosystem of tools that we get to leverage if we work in Python. Um, this is you know, uh, uh, just a cross section really of those tools. Um, and the, the sort of uh, concept of this one right, is sort of a, a stack from building from just uh, the, the Python language at the bottom up to uh, sort of higher and higher level level packages. So you know, at a relatively low level, you have packages like IPython, which we also leverage, and NumPy. Um, but as you build up, uh, you know, Pandas was a um, library written by Wes McKinney, who I understand, unfortunately, is not going to make it this afternoon. Um, but, but was sort of one of the first libraries that got written in Python that really allowed us lazy MATLAB and R data scientists uh, to use Python, right? So uh, we want to work with data frames, right? I just have explained to computer scientists so many times, I just want rows and columns. I basically want it to be like Excel, except I want it to be fast. And I don't want it to be like Excel in that it's going to break. So, but otherwise, right, I want uh, in quant finance land, a lot of times quants think in terms of, you know, every row might be a stock. Uh, so for every stock, you might have a bunch of dates. And then every column might be a different field of data. So you might care for a stock about what its price is. You might also care what its forward PE is. You might also care what its trailing PE is. Once you have this big, huge matrix of data, then you can start to do analyses and try to understand if you have signals in your data. So there's this awesome uh, stack of tools that we get to use if we use Python. Um, when Quantopian uh, began in 2011, it was um, a project started in uh, John Fawcett's shed behind his house until it got too cold. But basically, he decided that he wanted to write a backtester um, that would allow quants to backtest trading strategies. And that was something that uh, when he um, met quants, uh, he realized that everybody in the quant field was writing their own backtester. So this was a great opportunity to write a piece of software. Uh, there's no really great reason to reinvent the wheel. Every Every time a quant goes from uh, one job to another, uh, though they're not allowed to bring the code with them, so this seemed like a fantastic spot to create sort of a single um, open source library. Uh, so that was in 2012. Now, uh, a couple years later, um, we have uh, come a long way. Uh, so Quantopian's gone from uh, Foss's shed uh, to a floor of a building in downtown Crossing. Uh, we've got 38 employees currently who are mostly engineers. Um, but what we're doing is sourcing algorithms from our community. So we have a website. We let um, you know anybody who has uh, some Python programming ability or the interest in learning come onto our website and have access to data, write these trading algorithms. And now we're in the position of wanting to evaluate those trading algorithms and actually put real money behind them. Um, and so to do that, we realized that we were writing starting to write a bunch of internal software uh, that wasn't part of our product and our platform to evaluate trading algorithms. And we realized that you know, that would be something that would be really useful externally. So uh, we put together this library and we open sourced it, I think, around the end of this summer. 
Um, so PyFolio is uh, state of the art uh, and changing like daily and weekly and it's in its infancy, but it, um, reasonably active uh, so far already community. Um, and really the idea again is this is a set of analytics that is designed to analyze a portfolio uh, with respect to returns and risk characteristics. Um, and there's a lot of exciting things we want to do with it. Um, uh, and I'm going to show you where we've started. So it's open source, it's free, it's under the Apache V2 license. I have no idea what that means. Again, I just use open source software, I don't write it. But if you want to use it, I think that means it's easy for you to use it. Um, you can use it uh, on a standalone basis, so it's uh, self-contained. You can use it with Zipline. Zipline is the open source backtester that I mentioned. Um, or you can use it on our website um, on Quantopian, and we also have a hosted research environment uh, that's IPython based. Um, and finally, we did, uh, I don't know if we did or Syed did, but um, there's a way to use it with a Py this Pythalesians library as well. He's done some pretty cool stuff. Um, so if you want to use PyFolio um, in a standalone manner, this is all you have to do. Uh, you use Anaconda and uh, you just import it to your project. Pretty simple. Um, and what it's going to give you access to, uh, sort of mainly, is this really nice big set of visualizations. So you're going to hand in a pretty uh, consistent, pretty simple set of data. Might be something as simple as just a time series of returns, even for example, for like a mutual fund you might be interested in. The two ways of thinking about what you data you hand into PyFolio are you can either hand in returns based data only, and then you're kind of limited to returns based analyses, things that say, hey, what's the volatility? utility been, what's the um, time series correlation with other assets maybe in the marketplace been, or you can hand in both returns data and position level data. So if you're handing in the data about what transactions and buys and sells you made, stocks you held, then there's a richer set of outputs you can get. So some of the plots um, that you can see that are sort of miniaturized, but I'll go through these a little more, things like the equity curve. So this green line is, you know, this is some magical trading strategy that just only makes money every day. That's exactly what we're looking for, perfect. Um, we've got a bunch of rolling statistics, so it turns out in quant land that it's really always interesting not only to come up with a single estimate of something like uh, the volatility of your data or the risk adjusted returns of your data. But um, unfortunately for quants, quant finance is a very non-stationary um, world. And so you're often wanting to look at uh, rolling indicators over time that say, hey, over the last six months, what has been my average risk adjusted return? Um, because uh, everything in quant world are parameters or values that you estimate based on data. You'll see I'll get to a little bit later um, that there's a lot where you're interested not only in looking at, you know, uh, we don't show there's a summary table, but so not only rolling statistics, but also distributions of statistics, um, distributions of uh, data that you're getting out of your algorithm. Because you're always limited by the number of data points and the number of observations you make, just like anywhere in data science. Um, so we've got some tools that try to help you think about that. All right, so um, once you have, so here's an example if you're only going to pass returns into um, a function. So if you've just got a series of stock returns, you can hand those in to this function to create a tear sheet. And this is that summary table that I mentioned. So um, the common things uh, that are sort of the parameters that might define any back test. Um, so you've got a trading strategy, right? It's going to do something. But actually, really, it matters a lot sort of when you ask it to operate and at what sort of inception criteria. So this trading strategy was asked to run from uh, March or sorry, May 1st, May 21st, 2012 to 10, 28, 2015. So that's 41 months of back test. If I handed in another piece of data, which was when the strategy went out of sample or moved into live trading, I would have the ability to create um, statistics that break apart two regimes in sample and out of sample. And you can actually use that, I think, to create um, sort of a regime study yourself if you wanted to say, okay, I have a set of data that I care about, but it's actually three subsets of data that I want to look at um, broken out different ways. So right here, I just have one summary set of data. Um, the kinds of summary statistics we like to look at for quant strategies are things like, what was the annual return? So on average, this strategy made 38% a year. Well, that sounds great. Um, well, its annual volatility was 44% a year. 
that doesn't sound quite as great. That would have been a little bit of a wild ride, uh, certainly some, some years. Um, so quants look a lot at this sharp ratio, right? That's just uh, basically a measure of your risk-adjusted returns, the returns over that volatility. So what you'd like to have is that number uh, very high. Um, that's very hard to do. Mostly uh, returns come at the cost of risk that's assumed. And risk, mostly in the market, is experienced by think stocks going up as well as down. Um, so a sharp ratio of one or, or near one to two, three, that's a great sharp ratio strategy for something um, that is not sort of like a high frequency strategy. Um, if you get into very, very fast trading strategies um, that are really based on sort of very, very small differences in moving averages, you can find strategies that get into very, very high sharp ratios. So if you see a strategy and someone tries to explain to you, oh yeah, no, this one's way better. This is a sharp ratio of like five or six or 10. Um, that tends to be something that, uh, again, has um, a very limited set of parameters of where it can actually make that sharp ratio and probably very small capacity. So this looks pretty reasonable. Um, we have a bunch of other measures. Uh, I'll also point out we have an alpha and beta estimate. So um, I think you have to hand in a benchmark, although I don't see where we're doing it here. Do you have to hand in the benchmark? Anyway, you don't have to. It just goes and picks something. OK. He's one of the guys that actually did the actual work back there. Um, so, uh, so the concept of beta um, is really important to us in our workflow. Um, beta basically means what is your correlation with the broad market index. You can have a correlation to any um, risk factor, or any market index. Um, for us, our platform right now supports only trading US equities. And so what that means is the most common thing that strategies that people in the community come up with are things that trade um, sort of, uh, it's very hard to, not very hard, but it's very easy to tr pick things that trade with the market. So if you do something like say, hey, I know what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna find a, a couple levered ETFs and I'm gonna basically buy this levered ETF uh, when it's making some money and hope it's gonna make more money. You can achieve really great returns, but you're gonna have a lot of risk. So we like to look at this uh, beta value. A beta of one means you're perfectly correlated with the market. Uh, it means that if the S&P 500 goes up by 1% in a given day, your algorithm is very likely to go up by 1% in a given day. Day. If your beta gets above one, that means you're overcorrecting, but still correlated. So a beta of two, if the market takes a dip of 2% tomorrow, you're probably going to lose 4% tomorrow. Um, so we're actually, us, we're actually looking to see this number get towards zero. Um, so that's why we have it up in this summary table. Um, we can also look at when we lost money historically. Um, so a lot of times you look, or, or um, you know, people will look at the equity curve like I showed you, um, and we can skip ahead and look at a nice equity curve here, and there, you know, humans are great at recognizing patterns. So they'll say, well, this looks awesome. I lived on that green line and I ended up way up and to the right from where I was, right? So that's great, but what you don't notice by eye or, or doesn't jump out at you kind of at first is, well, what were my drawdowns? So as I like lived through that roller coaster ride up that green line, how many times had I lost money and, and how long was it when I had lost money until I made back past my previous peak. So that's what this worst drawdown periods is. It shows you your five worst drawdowns, how big they were, so 47%. That's like a really not a good drawdown. You wouldn't be able to put like a reasonable amount of capital behind this. Show this to someone who's in industry and they'd say, okay, you know, who knows what it is you're doing, but you know, this is basically just looks like it's following the market. Um, and it shows you your peak date, your valley date, when you recovered, and then how long it was. So you can also see that not only did you suffer a time period when you lost about half of your money, but you took you about 300 days to get back above your peak. So you can sort of picture yourself living through like that 200th day. Imagine if you knew you had like 100 more days before you were even going to break even from this trading strategy. Okay, so it shows you, uh, kind of highlights some of the risks. Um, so this is just looking at the returns to your strategy versus any benchmark you want to pass in. I've got the S&P 500. Um, and then the second plot is a volatility adjusted uh, picture of that. Uh, then I mentioned that we care about this beta or this correlation to the market and I showed you in that summary table this strategy had a beta of about one. Okay, so great, that dashed blue line in the top plot is at about one. But the other thing you can see is like, oh, interesting, there were times when this strategy had a beta or you know a trailing six or 12 month correlation 
that was actually quite below one at the beginning of the back test. And at times it actually had a beta that was about two. So you can also sort of get a sense of these estimates or these parameters that I care about, how consistent are they over time? Um, if you see parameters that you care about changing a lot over time, that can be okay, right? But you want to understand why. Um, because now it means that when you just do shorthand and look at one summary number, it might not capture what's happening that much. Um, so this is that estimate of rolling sharp ratio, right? Like, okay, it looks good. We said it's, it's a, well, it looks okay, right? It's around one. Um, but okay, yeah, you also realize there's times where you lived well below that line of one. Um, so you're aware of that. Um, and then this last plot is kind of cool. So I mentioned that you can have a beta, which is just a sort of uh, a word in this case, uh, um, domain specific word for a, a correlation. So you can have a correlation to the S&P 500, right? But you can have a time series correlation to any other time series you want, right? Like the phase of the moon um, or, uh, uh, you you know, the, the tides coming in and out, uh, crop rotations. Well, it turns out there are three really common risk factors that quants look at. Um, these are very basic ones uh, that you can just download from a, a professor's website. And they're basically looking at what's your correlation with a strategy that just buys small cap stocks and sells large cap stocks. So it turns out there's sort of like this known risk factor out there that, you know, you're taking on risk by buying small cap stocks, right? So um, there are smaller companies, uh, some incident that happens to them can make a bigger difference to them. Maybe they're uh, maybe they're um, uh, they're more likely to go up. They're more likely to go down. So small cap minus minus large cap, um, high growth companies minus low growth companies, and then momentum. So momentum is saying what about stocks that have gone up a lot in the past versus those that have gone down. And so these factors are created by building synthetic or, or portfolios of stocks that are uh, pretending that your strategy was doing one of those things specifically. And then we look and say, okay, for this trading algorithm that either I wrote or someone else wrote, I'm trying to evaluate, um, how much is it actually making money probably because of these factors? So with this one, you can see, okay, wow, like um, it's actually kind of wandering in and out of being pretty highly correlated with some of those factors. So again, something to be aware of, maybe I understand and this with this strategy I'm okay with that, I wanna take those risk factors on. A pure, kind of if you hear like a pure quant or pure alpha strategy, really you'd be looking for the residual or the alpha left after you took out any returns explained by those other risk factors. So ideally we're looking for strategies where when we look at that Fama French exposure plot, you've got these three lines really tight around zero in our particular use case. This is just the visualizations that go along uh, with that uh, drawdown plot. So you can see that that big, really long drawdown, that happened from when you first invested, right? So you're like, this seems like a great idea. I'm gonna invest my money in this strategy. 300 days later, do you think you still have you know, your, your brokerage account invested in that strategy? Probably not, uh, but moving on. Um, so this plot uh, is getting at, um, you know, a lot of times you are looking again at this equity curve and it can be very misleading because depending on how you invest your strategy, you might be reinvesting profits over time. And so it's difficult to sort of see across um, a time series that, that goes maybe 10 or 12 years out in time, like where did I really make and lose money? So here you're going to look at what were the monthly returns to my strategy um, by year and by month. And these plots I think were all like built in some cool library that we used that was built in. You guys probably know better than I do. So this was really easy to create, right? Win, which is awesome. Um, we have the returns by year. And then this one is the distribution of monthly returns. That's kind of cool because um, when you, let's say first deploy your strategy and you live through your first month of trading it, you know what your strategy made that month, right? Let's say you lost 20%. You'd look back at that plot and you'd say, hmm, that feels like a pretty low probability event given the distribution of the months that I I saw in my back test, that should be worrisome. Um, so that's a nice distribution to look at. And then these are showing you um, with a daily, weekly, or monthly view, how's that distribution of returns by quantiles. And so you can sort of see where your worst outliers. And these plots are kind of all designed to give you other different slices or ways of visualizing what happened to your strategy to hopefully help you notice um, if there's something that explains, you know, that's sort of a warning flag. A lot of, a lot of um, evaluating quant strategies is looking for um, you know, where it goes wrong or why it isn't going to work. And when you eliminate all of those things, you get increasing levels of confidence. 
Um, okay, so another uh, interesting aspect that you can look at with this is your exposure over time. Um, and what I mean by long short exposure is, so if this strategy just took $100,000 and, and invested it um, in one single stock, you would see this would be, the plot would just be a green bar with the green line at one. So I would be 100% in one long position. Uh, but this strategy is actually a dollar neutral or a market neutral strategy. And so again, you would have to pass that position information in um, to know this. But basically what we do is just aggregate up all the stocks you held long and all the stocks you held short um, and then look at your exposure over time. So this strategy is on average um, taking on perhaps a little bit of leverage, um, but it's, it's basically neutral where I have a dollar long, I have a dollar short. Um, the, the way people usually talk about a strategy like this is you're hedged with respect to the market's movements, hopefully, right? So, well, you've done something, presumably, hopefully, in this algorithm where you've said, these longs uh, should, should make more money, their price should go up more than these shorts. And if you're right about that, then you don't care what happened to the overall broad market, right? So uh, the market can go up, it can go down, but if your system of differentiating or betting that your longs are better than your shorts on a relative basis, if that wins, then you make money. That's the idea. Um, this is a plot just looking at exposure to sectors over time. So if you have a strategy that holds a lot of stocks, you can look at your positions over time, but that can become really complicated. So um, all stocks live in some sector. They can fall into some category like uh, an energy stock or a healthcare stock. And these are um, categorized by a couple of different data vendors in the market. Um, and I think we are looking at Morningstar asset classifications. Um, and that's because the Morningstar corporate fundamentals data is what we have integrated into our, our uh, production platform. Um, but there are a bunch of different sector uh, identifier, like sort of data vendors. So uh, this is just gonna be a plot where you can look and say, okay, if I consistently had a much higher exposure to one single sector than any other, then I would know something more now, right, about this strategy. Okay, this strategy is making money because it's actually only trading energy stocks, right? That'd be something I'd wanna be aware of. And then underneath, I'm just looking at how many stocks uh, do I hold in my portfolio. So this uh, strategy holds about 50 stocks. Um, that's a reasonably high number of individual stocks for somebody who's an individual investor, right? If you think about what you're gonna be paying um, to buy and sell each of these stocks, um, especially you're gonna be short half of these stocks, you're going to be paying interest and fees. Um, so this is starting to get towards a, a size of a larger strategy that would probably have, uh, need to have a, a bit of capital invested in it. Um, Okay, so now, let's see how much, how much time do I have left? Okay, so I'll go through this analysis quickly. If you have a finance background, this will be very simple to you. If not, we'll see if you get sort of what, I, what I'm driving at. But um, the idea here is that I don't necessarily know when I run a simulation how much I'm gonna pay the broker um, in order to trade, make these trades. There are some costs I can get a really good assumption about or a really good estimate. So I happen to know we're integrated with interactive brokers and I happen to know um, that depending on what size account I have, I'm gonna pay um, 0.75 cents a share, uh, anyway up to maybe a little bit higher than that, but let's say that. And I know that if I trade a very small number of shares, the, the lowest price they're gonna charge me for a commission is a dollar. Um, but what I don't know necessarily is when I go try to make that trade in the market, that could be any time of day, and I don't know exactly what price I'm gonna get and how close it's gonna be to the price that my quant model thought. So. Uh, different strategies that trade stocks at different rates and different types of stocks and different, uh, different names will have a different sensitivity to being wrong about what that cost estimate is. So this is just a sweep that's looking at what would my equity curve have looked like if I had a varying range of slippage assumptions. Um, we don't have zero on here because it tends to look a little bit crazy. Um, if you assume zero cost, a lot of strategies do very well and make money. But we're going anywhere from assuming three basis points to 50 basis points right or, or half of a percent and then for some strategies you'll look and you'll say oh wow this strategy once you get to 10 or 12 basis points of slippage it's going to lose money just basically no matter what right so that's something that you know you yourself would want to be aware of before you actually put your own money in it and that we want to think about and this is another way of looking at that uh, so here I'm looking at the average annual return that my strategy is going to make so sort of a summary stat derived from this chart up here and then I'm looking at it as I increase my slippage assumption and so this strategy
strategy is great, right? Even when I'm assuming a very high, well, what I'll tell you is a high degree of slippage, I'm still eking out some gain. So I'm not just like lighting money on fire. Many, many quant strategies, if you get out to that cost assumption, they basically will light money on fire. Um, okay, so I mentioned that you can use PyFolio um, on its own and, and all of that functionality that I just showed you, uh, I think you can do just on its own. Um, you can also use it in conjunction with the Quantopian website and the back tester um, that we've got and specifically I guess some of the stuff about looking at sector exposures, right? So if you're uh, using um, our research platform on Quantopian, then uh, you pass in your returns from a back test you ran on our platform, it'll go ahead and know um, that it can go grab that Morningstar asset classifications. Um, and so you also have the benefit of having all this, you know, minutely stock pricing data, corporate fundamentals, um, and then we're adding a bunch more data sources. So it just gives you a lot of stuff that you can sort of play with and try. Um, we've built in a couple of models for uh, thinking about transaction costs and slippage. Um, and we also have an API that lets you write your own custom model. I'm curious if anybody actually has done that. It's like great that we have it, but I'd like a like data point that says who has done it. Has anyone here written a custom transaction cost or slippage model? Even anywhere, not just on Quantopian? Oh yeah, all right, nice. You should put it on Quantopian. Um, okay, so <laughs> that one guy in this whole room. So that tells you, I think pretty much everybody uses one of the built-in models uh, that we have because it gives you a good, a good sense of what's going on. Um, so you, like I mentioned, there's a way to pull uh, a back test that you've run on our platform into this research environment and then run this tear sheet. And hopefully someday soon, you won't even have to do that. Um, you'll just get it as part of the, the performance report that you get out when you run a strategy. All right. So. Um, We'll see how much time I have to run through, but this is sort of a sneak peek at some exciting stuff that we're working on. Some of this is in the um, is in the library already, but some of it is actively under development. So um, I sort of walked through, hopefully made clear this motivation of this use case to understand like what your strategy is doing and if it is making money, why? That's like something that you care about. The other really big thing you care about in quant is is it going to keep making money? So let's say you've satisfied yourself that you know the equity curve is up and to the right. You understand why it's consistent. It's high sharp ratio, everything is great with the world, right? Um, that's in sample data, typically, is how we think about that, right? That's data that, you know, depending on whether you wrote that algorithm or, or you, you didn't and you're looking at it from the outside like we are, um, that's all data that, that you could have had access to to overfit. Not that anyone would do that, but it can happen even by accident. So how do you predict future results? Um, what we've been doing is working on some modeling techniques using Bayesian analog analysis to try to take uncertainty into account try to extrapolate from historical levels of uncertainty and forecast out into the future, and then try to be smart as we're getting out of sample data coming in about real trading to say, how quickly can we know uh, that this model indeed performs how we thought it would um, or not? Um, so a couple high level things, we use a T distribution to model the returns instead of a normal distribution. So stock market returns are not normally distributed, which is a big problem um, for doing like a lot of easy statistical analyses in the field. Um, and this relies on PyMC3, which is a library written by Thomas Vicky, who works on my team and maybe some of you here might know. He's a huge nerd and he's written a lot of really cool stuff that we get to use. Um, so this is one of the really cool things uh, that he wrote that we get to use. Uh, this GIF is showing you um, basically starting off with some very broad estimate about what my sharp ratio might be. So this is all actually thinking about estimating my, remember I told you I'd like a sharp ratio of around one. This data set is a toy data set. It has a true sharp ratio of around 0.5. And what this simulation is showing you is, okay, well, as I draw samples from a set of data, right, th those samples come from this T distribution around 0.5, well, they can you know, be a large range of numbers, right? And I don't know what order I'm gonna draw them in. So what we do is we treat that sampling of new data and we either do that from backtest data to simulate looking out into the future, or we have real ob observations of new data coming in. And what we're doing is basically adding new, and new data to our analyses, to our Bayesian model, and trying to get a better and better estimate of where we think the sharp ratio is. So what's cool about this analysis is that we can do it um, and do it both where we forecast out into the future and then as we get real data coming in that's out of sample, we can overlay on that blue um, sort of um, increasing confidence cone what's actually happening and we can see how they line up. So we can make forecasts about how much out of sample data would you need to have to feel you had made like the right model and you had a good prediction. And then as real data comes in, you can sort of say, yeah, this matches um, or this doesn't match. 
Um, so this is an example of creating one of these forecasts out into the future. Um, there's a bunch more data I've hidden at the back, right? But this is looking at the green is continued to be in sample data. And now suddenly on this date in October of 2009, um, this strategy goes out of sample. And that's data that I didn't know about when I built my model. So first what we do is we draw this Bayesian cone out into the future. And that's basically uh, trying to describe a region that's like from a 95% to a 5% region of probability based on our simulations. And then the dark blue is like a 75 to 25% confidence. Then I look at my out of sample data and what I want to see is actually what this one looks like, right? I want to see that my out of sample data looks indeed like what I would have expected. It seems like it's between 25 and 75 percent probability. This is not always the case as my next example will show you. I won't go through the rest of the plots below are more nerdy Bayesian distributions that we don't have time for, but they're cool. Uh, so here's a real world example. This is a strategy that won the Quantopian Open. Sidebar, we have a paper trading contest. People love to try to game paper trading contests. Um, they love to try to fit models to predict uh, the future and get really good scores. This is probably something, I'm not a Kaggle user, but this is probably something people have to deal with in Kaggle. So this green line is, uh, we, we make you submit to us a two year back test. So we said, okay, a little suspicious already. I feel, uh, I think I was suspicious already. Although it does look good. This looks perfect, right? And then what happens is we, uh, at this point in time, this was back earlier this year, we made you paper trade it for 30 days only. So we wanted to have a winner of this contest every month. So after 30 days of trading, that's that blue line right there. Well, this looks great, right? That's out of sample data. It's up and to the right. It's consistent with the historical data, right? So what could possibly go wrong? Uh, so let's zoom in on this time period and let's say, well, okay, so by our eye and the amount of data that I showed you, this looks reasonable, like at least it's still up and to the right, but where does it fall within that Bayesian cone prediction that we would have made? Now, we didn't actually have this analysis at this point last year, or we would have said, hmm, something seems a little bit off. We kind of did say that, but in the interest of following through and letting uh, the contest winner get deployed on real capital, so we deployed these algorithms to $100,000, right? So we said, okay, you know, and, and then looking back at it, right? So this is really on the edge of this cone. This looks like it's probably in a zone that really, you know, we should have sort of a, almost a 95% confidence level that the strategy is doing worse, at least out of sample, even after a month than it did in sample. But, you know, whatever. A month of data is like kind of difficult to forecast based on. Um, so let's see what actually happens. Okay, so yes, actually what happens is uh, the strategy almost immediately, right, so if we zoomed back in at that cone, right, we were sort of like hugging the very edge of that cone even after 30 days. This one's a little bit offset in time because this one, the cone starts, I think, actually when we deployed real money against it, but either way, uh, pretty quickly the strategy's real returns falls way outside of this Bayesian cone. Um, so if we were trading this um, either ourselves or in a portfolio where we sort of didn't have an obligation to keep it running, you'd say like, okay, well, you're fools to keep this thing running. Um, it's obviously not behaving how it was. And why is that? Well, that's because it's in sample sharp and it's in sample statistics did not at all predict the results that happened out of sample. And then, you know, I use that as sort of a funny example, but this happens all the time. And not just with like the users of Quantopian who are trying to scam the Quantopian open. This happens all the time in the real world, in the industry, even when people are trying really hard on purpose not to fool themselves because it's their own money and their own reputation on the, on the line. It's very difficult to avoid overfitting. And so you can see how having some mechanism that gives you, sort of keeps you honest and gives you a projection about where your model thinks your results should come in can kind of keep you honest about knowing sort of when you might have to admit uh, defeat. Here, I think we could all, whether we had a Bayesian analysis or not, you know, have figured that out. Um, all right, so there's a bunch more stuff that uh, we've written about this uh, Bayesian cone, as we call it, or Bayesian analysis um, that you can find. And I think these slides and resources will be available. And uh, Thomas, who works with me, knows a ton more about this um, than I do. Uh, so you can get a hold of him as well. Um, and then summary on PyFolio, uh, there's a webinar where you can basically rehear me saying this same lecture, roughly, um, with a little bit more quant finance uh, nerdy detail. Um, that probably needs to be updated. Um, and this is still a very young library, so please contribute and give us bug submissions. Um, and before I wrap up, I just want to plug the other two talks uh, of my friends and colleagues, Andrew Campbell, who will be on stage right after me, um, and then tomorrow afternoon, Scott Sanderson, um, who's written a really cool API uh, that is inside of Quantopian for running cross-sectional analyses. And thank you very much for your time. 
so it sounds like we have a couple of minutes for questions. So this, yep, so the question was, um, does this work for equities only or what about futures? So um, this being the library of Pyfolio, you can hand any returns into it, um, anything you want. Yep, any time series you want. Uh, the Quantopian platform, it has uh, futures um, coming online the, this quarter. There's a couple of folks beta testing it. So if you want to trade futures on Quantopian, email me and I'll get you access to the beta. Options, equity options. No options yet or no, and we're not working on options yet. It looks really hard. Yep. Um, so, so, so I think that what lives in Pyfolio is you can pass in a way to categorize the data. It doesn't have access to those sector codes. And I am like a little bit making this up, but I believe this is how it works. That if you have some like uh, ca categorization data point, you can pass that in. But you wouldn't have access to these Morningstar asset classification fields. What you can probably get is a static snapshot of sectors or classifiers like today and then you'll like suffer a little bit of survivorship bias of how that data goes back into the past. Any other questions? I will be around after this. Okay, I'll answer one more and then I'll be around afterwards this afternoon if anyone has. Oh, oh my God, it's so horrible. Uh, the question was what about stock splits? Um, so we, I think currently finally handle like splits, dividends, mergers, and all those adjustments. I think we handle them correctly and in two ways. Uh, so one way uh, when you're looking back at data in, from the future back and one way when you're living through the split, it's kind of a hassle. Yes, we do. We have done like a bunch of work um, to try to handle that correctly. If you try it and it doesn't work, submit another <laughs> bug to us. But we're, yeah, we're working on it actively. Sure. You know, all this stuff comes in one package. Uh, Pyfolio is like one small package, yeah, um, and I don't know how you like break it apart, but Zipline, the back tester, is another separate package, so you can use them together or on their own. All right, thank you.